Hello, I'm Tony DeMaria, the editor of Jack, here with another issue of Inside Jack. And today I'm talking to Dr. Sanjeev Saxena, who I think is very well known to the cardiovascular community. And he's professor of medicine at the Robert Wood Johnson School of Medicine in New Brunswick, New Jersey. And Sanjeev uh, has prepared an article in Jack that exploits the data from the AFFIRM trial, the trial of rhythm control versus rate control for patients with atrial fibrillation. And as everyone knows, the AFFIRM trial really did not show a superiority of one form of therapy over the other. In fact, there was a trend toward a superiority of medical therapy. And what Dr. Uh, Saxena and his colleagues have done in this important study was to look at rate control versus rhythm control for specific antiarrhythmic agents, uh, specifically amiodarone, the, the most commonly used agent, versus uh, uh, sotalol, uh, versus the least commonly used agents, the type 1C, such as propafenone. And uh, interestingly enough, they showed, again, there was no superiority of rhythm control. And in fact, there was a tendency for the patients who received these antiarrhythmic drugs uh, to do less well, particularly in regard to amiodarone. So Sanjeev, let me ask you, uh, did you find uh, that these results were surprising, that in fact uh, the antiarrhythmic drugs uh, seem perhaps to have a, a downside? Uh, Tony, I, uh, the results I think fill in gaps in knowledge and analysis of the original affirm paper. So if, as you mentioned earlier, there was a trend to increase mortality in the rhythm control arm on a firm, but we ascribe that almost um, uh, universally as due to older antiarrhythmic drugs. The AFFIRM trial was never designed to look at individual drug outcomes. So we had to develop a mechanism to analyze the data fairly comparing an individual antiarrhythmic drug with rate control, which is what we did in this study. The surprise in the study was that the increased mortality risk appeared to lie in the non-cardiac mortality associated with amiodarone, which is widely believed to have the least mortality risk among the antiarrhythmic drugs. So that in itself was a bit of a surprise. And this was accompanied by information that suggested that hospitalizations that were seen with antiarrhythmic drug therapy for these three agents were somewhat at a higher level than with rate control, the difference being about 10% of about three years, roughly. But these hospitalizations with amiodarone were more dire and more severe than with sotalol or class 1C agents. So one might ask, Sanjeev, why uh, were the hospitalizations more frequent? Was it proarrhythmia? Was it that these patients were having recurrent atrial fibrillation or strokes? Can you uh, help us with that? I think this is one of the most remarkable insights from this analysis was to identify patients who fared poorly with each of these individual agents. So in a nutshell, the risk of hospitalization and secondarily some mortality risk lay in two aspects of the atrial fibrillation conundrum. Some baseline characteristics at the time of entry in specific atrial fibrillation subpopulations. So elderly patients over 75, female gender, comorbidities, pulmonary disease, and surprisingly, the presence of pre-existing and adequately treated thyroid disease was a particularly important risk factor for amiodarone therapy. So the baseline characteristics and the choice of agent interacted, and then there were time-dependent issues. 
the conversion from sinus rhythm to atrial fibrillation had a deleterious effect on outcome. Changes in angina class, um, changes in heart failure, both are towards the negative side, had a deleterious outcome. So what this gave us is a true longitudinal picture of outcomes over time and identified increased risk with individual antiarrhythmic drugs, which was not originally planned in the AFIRM trial. So the bottom line, Sanjeev, uh, your current practice, are, are you uh, uh, taking most of your atrial fib patients and treating them with rate control? And if you're doing rhythm control, are you selecting one of the antiarrhythmic drugs preferentially? I think the implications of this data are that certain groups of subgroups of atrial fibrillation patients are not suitable for certain individual antiarrhythmic drugs for rate con for rhythm control. However, the rhythm the rate control patients also did not have a great cardiovascular uh, outcome either. They had very high hospitalization rates, around 40% at three years. What it points out to us is the major limitations in our current therapies for atrial fibrillation and the importance to search for new therapies. And what I do in my personal cardiovascular practice is do hybrid therapy. I combine drugs and ablation, drugs and pacing, ablation and pacing, uh, and try to increase the ability to maintain sinus rhythm. So for purposes of cardiovascular outcomes, it's not whether you're in atrial fib or sinus rhythm at any given time. It's how much sinus rhythm do you have on a longitudinal basis. And our data would suggest that patients who are more than 75% of the time in sinus rhythm have a better outcome than, ever, than people who can't maintain that level of sinus rhythm in their long-term follow-up. Well, that's an excellent insight. We do need better therapies. Uh... And for now, uh, there's still some, some reason to try to keep our patients in sinus rhythm if we possibly can. Thanks very much for being with us. For Inside Jack, I'm Tony DeMaria.